Amen. Congratulations to all y'all. Welcome to the family. Boy, we go home right now. It'll be a good day. Amen. So feel free if you need to leave. But the Lord has a word for us today. So one good thing about getting a little older and not enjoying speaking in front of people is that with my eyesight, I can't read my notes with my glasses on and I can't see any of you with my glasses off. So y'all just one big blur of sea of people, which makes it handy. So y'all can't be making eyes at me. I can't tell if you're mad or upset or happy, so. Y'all feel free to run the gambit. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for, Lord, just what you've already done today. Lord, the, the salvations, the baptisms, Lord. Lord, we love being a, a body of Christ that is obedient to your promptings in the moment. So, Lord, we just ask that uh, you just continue to stoke that fire within us to keep us active and actively listening to the, your promptings and your words that when you say to move, that we move no matter what's going on. Lord, we never want to be a church or a, a people that get stuck in tradition, that you can only baptize at these times on these days, that you can only do these things on certain, hello, certain days and times and, and get locked into um, the tradition that can cause a, a church to die. So, Lord, we love you for all you do. Lord, continue to move us and to uh, adjust us when we get askew. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, also, I want you all to be in prayer for the Gonzalez family. Um, if you have not heard or know yet that our, one of our current elders, uh, Papa G, uh, his beautiful bride, Mama G, went to be with the Lord on Thursday. Um, so, please be in prayer for them and their family. Um, as they go through this this time the Lord knows that uh, she's dancing on the streets of gold with Jesus So they've been a big part of this church for a very long time. So please keep them in your prayers All right, I'm squishing up here because my foot's all wet Hey, dudes are not waterproof by the way All right, so sticks and stones um, a couple of uh, three or four weeks ago sitting right over here during uh, Jason's one of Jason's messages um, I just heard the Lord say sticks and stones and you know the first thing that popped into my mind was the phrase that we all know and love is what sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me well who else in here besides me thinks that's a load of crap <laughs> words hurt words can hurt words are powerful they have meaning and so we're going to dive into that today and talk more about the words that we speak, the manners that we speak, the, the jesting that we speak in sometimes. And Lord, it's, um, it's hard to, to listen to some of this because sometimes it really speaks directly to our hearts. Um, and when I say that, I'm speaking to myself. Um, I never want to get up here and try to speak or, or teach or preach upon something that I'm not currently going through at the moment or I just come out of because I don't have some big fancy seminary degree. I didn't go to Bible college or Bible school. Crap. <laughs> Amen. So, I mean, so 18 years ago, I wasn't even saved. And I've been full time at this church for like seven years. So it just goes to show that if the Lord's prompting you to do something, don't let anything stand in your way. Just do it because his, his, your obedience to his prompting and his words that he's telling you to do um, will be rewarded. And uh, he will take you as far as you're willing to go, as fast as you're willing to follow him. Amen. All right. So the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Proverbs 18, 21. We've all heard this, that, that proverb before. We've read it. Most of you probably could have started quoting it when I started speaking it out. Um, so what does that all mean? You know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. It means we have the, the ability to lift up or tear down everyone that's around us. We have the ability to encourage or discourage. We have the ability to call down healing or call down curses. 
We have the ability to do so many things with our words if we will just use them in the right manner for the right reasons at the right time. Amen? They can hold a lot of power over our lives if we allow them to. So, Ed, you didn't know what I was going to call you out, did you? If I walked up to Ed and told him his pink beard looked stupid, Do you think he would be offended by that? Why? I mean, I told him he looked dumb. Wouldn't he, be, wouldn't he be offended by the fact that I told him he looked stupid? Well, no, because he doesn't have a pink beard. Now, Pinky, where are you at? <laughs> what are you hiding for, brother? If I said that to Pinky, it might have a little different connotation. It would mean something different to him. If I said that to him. I didn't realize you were up there, brother. Sorry. Thanks you for praying, though. I appreciate it. So, but when, if it doesn't, if it's not true about you, then you don't hold the same offense. You don't hold what they say to much, you don't hold, it doesn't hold water to you because it's not true. Now, if I walked up to a young lady who had body image issues because of the way that she sees women portrayed in the movies and in social media and advertisements. And because of what she sees that the world portrays as a beautiful, right-weighted woman, and maybe she doesn't see herself in that manner. If I walked up to that same young lady and I told her that she was fat, even though she wasn't, but her body image, her, her thinking that she held, or her belief that she held upon herself made her believe that she was, those words would hold an impact because of what she believes about herself. Not because it's true, but because of the way she perceives herself to be. Sticks and stones can break bones. I come off a ladder when the girls were, I think about one years old, one year old, and broke my heel on a job site. I got screws and pins in my heel. It broke my ankle in three spots. Um, you know, I was out of work for like two and a half months to heal. But you know what happened to those bones? They healed. I had hip replacement two years ago. That very night, less than 12 hours after my surgery, they had me up walking. 36 hours after that, I was released from the hospital. Within six weeks after that, I was walking, no cane, no pain, no nothing. Because those things heal. But what happens when we carry a scar from an emotional word that someone said about us or said to us? We can carry those for decades. So if I woke up my children every morning, if I walked into Ava's room every single morning and walked square up to her, shook her awake, said, good morning, wake up, you're stupid. Eventually, she would start to believe that she's stupid. If I did it day after day after day after day, every time she tried to accomplish something, every time she did something, I told her she failed at it and that she was dumb for even trying what do you think would happen eventually? Eventually, she would stop trying, and she would honestly believe that she was dumb. Because the things that we're told over and over and over again, whether someone else is telling them, or there sometimes we can do that to ourselves. We can tell ourselves the same thing over and over again, and eventually, we will start to believe it. I'm going to see if this works better the second service than did the first service. How many of y'all in here were told something as a child or even as an adult that you believed to be true, something that was, was not friendly, not fun, not nice, but you believed it to be true maybe for years or decades, but now you've come to realize that that is not who you are in Christ and it is no longer true, but you believed it to be true. Amen. All right. So the first service participated that well. Now this is where we're going to see if y'all can participate better. I would like one of you to come give a brief testimony and share about that experience. 
Don't all fight. Come on over here, over here. Come use the fresh bread stand. Brief, please. So when I was about, probably when I was a kid, probably about when I was in sixth grade, 10 or 11 years old, I think. There you go. Uh, there you go. When I was in sixth grade, about 10 or 11 years old, um, people started calling me, saying that I had anger issues, um, saying I was an angry child. Um, and I believed it because um, just a few months earlier, I had met my dad for the first time. And then he had nothing to do with me after that. Just immediately, he walked away from me. So I, I believed him, I started getting angry. And, um, and it led up until I was about 13. Um, I was at a church on Sunday with the youth group. They asked for people to come up and get saved or who wanted to get saved, and I did. Um, and then I asked, then I started praying, I was like, God, can you please take this anger away from me? Please help me. And I wanted that Pop-Tart, um, a Pop-Tart answer. I wanted it right away. And I didn't get it, so then I turned away from my Heavenly Father. And I went down this road of anger. I went to counselors who told me I was angry. I was sitting in a room full of people um, for an anger management class that I was required to go to because I got in a fight in school. And the first thing the counselor said when she walked in, she pointed at me and said, man, you're angry. You are an angry person. And for a professional, for someone in a professional position to say that to me, I mean, it um, it really drove into my mind and I kept that all the way up until I was 22 probably. And then I still had my back to Jesus and everything still walking away, um, even though I was saved. Um, and then I just started telling people, I was like, I, I know what I need, I need patience. That's what I need, I need patience. I kept telling people over and over. And then, and then I got it, probably one of the worst ways possible. Um, I got diagnosed with cancer in 2016. And um, the thing is, I didn't get angry. The time I should have been angry, I didn't get angry. I. Um, they told me, they're like, you, you have a week to choose or you're gonna die. Um, choose to live, do these, do these treatments or, or die. And honestly, I always told myself if I ever had cancer, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't fight. And then I looked at my mom's face because they asked that question in front of my mom. And I was just like, I'll fight. Amen. I'll fight. And man, the patience that, The, the patience that I gained through that fight, sitting there in hospital beds um, every month for like three or four years. Um, and then after that at home and, and at the hospital on and off for the next two or three years, um, took a lot of patience and I gained it. I gained it because I asked for it. I didn't even ask God directly for it, but because I was saved, he heard me. And he gave me gave me what I asked for, just in a way that I wasn't wanting or expecting. Amen. Um, and then five, six months ago, I was, I was finally said, God, I need your help. And I was walking down Walmart book aisle, and I look up, and I see a book that says, Faith Moves Mountains. I opened it up, and um, if y'all want to read this passage, y'all can. I saw the passage right away. That said was it's Deuteronomy 31 8. And it um, immediately I was like, I'm going, I need to go to church. I need to go to church. And I have been here before, not really listening, just coming. And I came here. And man, it hit me like a wave as soon as I walked in. And then, when you know, two weeks later, I'm getting baptized at the main street. Amen. Amen. And my anger's gone. 
angry not here anymore. I mean, I have angry outbursts like everyone does. Everyone has them. But my patience outweighs my anger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for sharing. When we surrender our life over to the Lord, he redeems us. Just like we, we shared, the, you know, partook of the baptisms this morning already to the point to where when they went under that water and they came back up, they were washed clean. All the hateful things that they carried all their life, all the things that they had gone through that no longer were pleasing to themselves or to the Lord, those things washed away because the old man died and the new man rose. And when we can do that daily, we can die to self daily. We no longer have to live trapped in the, the nonsense or the crap that people have told, about, told us all our lives. But when we can live in a world of encouragement, then things can change. The world can change. We can change this community and beyond uh, for the better. You know, the other thing when the Lord showed me when he gave me this message after the, the sticks and stones will break my bones, he also showed me that the sticks are where Jesus was crucified. In the Garden of Gethsemane where, Gethsemane, where he gave his life voluntarily over to be beaten and crucified for our salvation. He bore the sins that he didn't commit for each one of us. The torment that he went through. The pain that he went through and the anguish that he went through on that day, on top of that mountain, on that cross, was excruciating. Yet he bore it for each one of us. And then he was buried in the, the tomb. And then three days later he rose and the tomb was opened and that stone was rolled away. Amen. To give us a freedom and a life to live free of, of the sins and give us the forgiveness of our sins and allow us to be able to walk like Christ walked if we're willing to be obedient and speak and do the things that Christ did. Words create worlds is a quote by Abraham Joshua Herschel is who is accredited to say in that quote. But words do create worlds. They create a world of our perception and our, uh, around us, our atmosphere around us. If we constantly are speaking hate and anger, then that is the world that we're producing around us. If we speak life and encouragement, we produce that world. If you don't believe that words produce worlds, flip over to Genesis. Because in Genesis 1 is the history of creation. God didn't need anything to build all of this. He did it by himself without anyone's help. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said... Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Again, he continued, he called the dry land earth, and he called and he said and he spoke everything we see into existence. He spoke it. So if you don't think that words can create worlds, read your Bible. Because God created the world we live in by speaking it into existence. And if we're made in his image, then we have the ability to speak things into existence. The life and death and the power of the tongue. Are you speaking life into your wife or husband? Are you speaking life into your kids? 
Or do you want to eat of the bitter, rotten fruit that comes from anger, bitterness, and hatred? Any of y'all in here that are business owners or bosses at work, have you went home and had it, found it hard to turn off the way you speak to your employees when talking to your spouse or your kids? Anybody? I had a problem with that when we used to own the cabinet shop. I, my wife probably still thinks I have a problem with it now. But I, I, she accused me of that a couple times. She goes, stop talking to me like I work for you at your shop. But on the flip side of that coin, how many of you mamas have dealt with kids all day, and then when your husband gets home, <laughs> you talk to your husband like you're talking to the kids? Because I have accused my wife of talking to me like I'm one of her kids. I had to remind her we only have five kids. I am not the sixth even although I act like it on occasion. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. But when we, when we speak in certain roles and in a certain manner, then it, it changes the atmosphere. I can speak to my cabinet shop workers or construction workers in a certain way that's acceptable. Because if you work construction or been on a construction job site, you understand what I'm talking about. Now, you don't need all the other stuff that they do on there. But there's a certain tone that comes when you're a boss, and you have to have a certain type of authority when you're talking to employees to get the job done. Yet when you go home and you, have a, you struggle to turn that particular tone off or that particular verbiage off, then it doesn't translate to your spouse or your children the same because you've changed atmosphere. The atmosphere at home isn't the same as the atmosphere at work. And sometimes it's a struggle for us to make those changes. But we have to be able to flow with the Spirit of the Lord to know what the atmosphere around us is and be able to walk in that manner that we're called upon at that time. You know, the world is backwards and upside down. It tells us that sticks and stones will hurt us and the words are harmless. Scripture tells us there's life and death in the power of the tongue and those that eat of its fruit. If you're a bought, born-again Christian sitting in here today, and we'll praise the Lord, we have three more that joined our ranks today. Then... You are a son or daughter of the Most High King. You're an heir to the throne of the Most High God. Are you walking like that? Are you representing him well with your words and actions, knowing that you're an heir to the throne? So we can take a step back and take it you know, down a notch and go, okay, let's look at, look at the President of the United States. If they're kids, not the current one, please, Sorry, I'm not supposed to get political, but it is time to vote. So get out and vote. Biblical convictions for the people who hold the same thoughts that you have. Vote for those people. But, so the President of the United States, if they've got a child, a teenage kid, and that kid runs crazy and wild, does that reflect upon the parents? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have to watch the things that we say and the, the, where we're at and what we're doing because the, our words and our actions will affect those that are around us. Because worlds, words create worlds. Sometimes our world is, is, con, is constrained to our particular household. That's one world. Your job side or your, your, your place of employment is another world. Church is a third world. In this world here, everybody walks in the door, not everybody, most people, will walk in the doors with a smile on their face and a joy in their heart, even if it's fake. Because that's, this is the place we're supposed to be happy, right? We're supposed to walk in here and when somebody asks you how you're doing, what's the answer? I'm fine. I'm good. 
But how many of y'all have walked in this door or any other church and somebody said, good morning, how are you today? And you said, I'm fine or I'm good. And deep down in your heart, you were not fine or good. Anybody? Everybody should have raised their hands. Because I imagine at one point or another, every single one of you walked in to this church or any place else and said, I am fine when asked, how are you doing? Yet you were not fine. Our words matter. Now, Scripture does say we want to speak things into existence as if they already were. So is it necessarily a bad thing then that you said, I'm fine even though I'm not? No. Not necessarily a bad thing unless... You don't have someone that you can confide in, that you can unburden yourself. Galatians 6 2 talks about bearing one another's burdens. Monday night, I was privileged to give the message up here to the men, and you know, I tried to really drive home the importance of having an accountability partner or a friend, a brother in Christ, or for you ladies, a sister in Christ, to be able to confide issues in. Some of the deepest, darkest things that maybe you've never shared ever before in your life, but someone that can help carry that load. Now, men, do not confide trouble with your wife with another woman. Women, do not confide issues with your husband to another man. Lines, those lines should not be crossed. You should not have, I know some people are going to be like, my best friend, we've been, I've known this girl for 30 years and we're best friends. Well, Okay, but there's certain things you, a man can't talk to another woman about. If they're going to talk about those type of things, it better be with their wife, and vice versa for the women. But we have to have people that we can talk to, someone that you know is going to take what you say to the grave, because there are times when people confess things or they talk to things that, to somebody that they're struggling about thinking that it's going to be kept in confidence, and it is not. Now, the world just got a whole lot bigger when it was meant to be a two-person world. Yet when that second person shared in the third person, and it became to the third, and then the third shares it with the fourth, what do we call that? Gossip. Do you think gossip takes place here at King's Trail? <laughs> Absolutely. Should it take place here at King's Trail? Absolutely not. But we tend to take the words that people share with us, and because they trusted you, and you trust this person, you don't think that this person is going to say anything. But you know what happens? You know what that person has? Somebody they trust. And you know what that person has? Somebody they trust. And before you know it, what you shared in confidence with one person has now made it to about 15 different people that each one of those people trusts. But you'll reach a point where that some person doesn't have a trust in you or you don't have a trust in them. And sooner or later, it comes out. No matter what it is, all things done in the dark will come to the light. So we have to make sure that when we talk to people, we have the ability to talk freely and openly. Counselors are good for that. They're paid to keep your confidence. There are certain things that get told to the pastors here, me, Jason, lay pastors, elders. You know, one of the questions we ask when we bring people up on that, to that level is, can you keep confidence? That's something that somebody says. And the answer is always yes. But sometimes we have to ask the question, even from your spouse. There are things that get confessed to me or Jason or other pastors and stuff that our wives do not know. And everybody will be like, well, you're one, so you should be able to talk to them about those things. Yes, but there's some things that we get told that they don't need to carry. Because all of us are human, and we all tend to take those things in, and it's hard when you're told certain things, not to change your perspective about somebody. And if I get confessed to something and I go home and talk to my wife, now she has to carry it and we run the risk of her perceiving that person differently than she did. And when you perceive somebody different, then what do you typically happens at that point, you end up treating them different. When your perception of someone changes, 
the treatment of that same person changes to match the new perception. If you were new to the, if we have anybody new here today? Brand new, never been to this church? Amen. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming. If, if, I, if somebody walked up and introduced you and I together, and they told you before you got here that I was very unfriendly and rude, your perception of me would be that I was unfriendly and rude. No matter, so no matter what I say to you at that point, you will take to a degree of me being unfriendly. I could say it very politely, but your brain's going to translate it to be somewhat unfriendly or rude because that was your preconceived perception of who I am. Now, I pray that if we got to know each other, you would know that I'm not rude or unfriendly, although there could be a couple in here that would disagree with that statement. <laughs> One of my hand raised up back there. Thanks, man. <laughs> so, when we pre-perceive something because of somewhat, somewhat, someone else told us, then we run the risk of never knowing the truth. If somebody told you not to do business with somebody because they're a cheat and a liar, are you likely to do business with them? No. So what if you now talk to someone? Okay, let's use Shane since he decided to peek up to me a little bit ago. So Shane's a, he's a contractor. So if somebody walked up and told you, don't let Shane build your house because he's a cheat and a liar. And so you didn't use him. And then you went and told somebody else that, you, that said, hey, I'm going to have Shane build my house. And you go, oh, don't use him. He's a cheat and a liar. You have no evidence that he was a cheat and a liar. Yet you just spread the rumor and the gossip and now have affected someone's business. By the way, he's not a cheater or a liar to my knowledge. I've done business with him several times. But when we talk about those things and we talk about things that we've heard, well, I've heard such and such about so-and-so. I've heard this about her, or I've heard this about him. And we always use it under the guise of, well, I'm just trying to protect my friend. I'm just trying to warn them. Well, you know what would be so much better if we would all mind our own business? If we would all learn to stick within our world and speak words of encouragement, to speak words of affirmation. Y'all remember, how, who in here is old enough to remember Saturday Night Live and the words of affirmation? <laughs> it was a great skit. Go look it up if you're too young to remember all that. But it's true. When we can constantly and repeatedly say stuff to ourselves or to the people that are around us that are affirming, that are uplifting and encouraging, we can change the atmosphere. When we had our gym, one of my favorite things to do during class that we would coach us stuff was to just to go around and cheer people on. It's uplifting for me to be cheerful and uplifting to those who are in a struggle. Whether it's a physical struggle working out or it's a mental struggle, whatever it is, I, my, one of our things that we really enjoy doing, my wife and I, is to encourage people and lift people up. But sometimes we, we get wrapped up in the friendly jest or sarcasm because I can be quick-witted with some sarcasm to the point of being rude and unfriendly. So I'm working on that. I've got to learn how to control that better. There's so much to talk about when it comes to words. Uh, let's go to Exodus 3. In Exodus 3, this is Moses at the burning bush. It said, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. 
why the bush does not burn. But when God saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. So God came to Moses in a burning bush and started to talk to him. How many of y'all would take notice of that? At one point, Scripture talks about a talking donkey. We've got several horses at home. We've got a donkey named Fiona. And I can tell you what, I would sit up and pay attention if Fiona started talking to me while I was out in the field. <laughs> but God lives inside us now as a form of the Holy Spirit. And he talks to us daily. He no longer needs a burning bush. He no longer needs a donkey to be able to talk to us. Because he lives inside us in our heart. If you're bought, born again, sealed by the Holy Spirit through salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 But time and time again, we hear people talk about, well, God doesn't talk to me. Or I don't hear him like you do. Or like Jason does, or Papa G does, or Elder Fred. Well, I'd venture to guess to say that one of two things is taking place at this point. If you know, know that you know that you know that you're saved, but you can't hear the, 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 spirit, the word of the Lord talking to you, then you're just not listening. Or if you're not sure that you're saved or not, again, this is always the time to do it here at church. But the most, like Jason says all the time, the most terrifying scripture in the word talks about, depart from me for I never knew you. Because if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, the only thing he's saying to you is come to me. Let me give you the free gift of salvation. And then once you accept that gift of salvation, then it opens up. And he's willing to talk to you about everything that goes on in your life. And he's going to talk to you about everything that's going on in your life. How many of y'all ever faced a problem that you think is too small for the Lord to handle? How come it is that we only go to him on the big things? But you know that every day he's sitting back talking to us, loving on us, trying to build us up with the words of affirmation, trying to drown out the nonsense and the hatred that somebody else has spewed into your life over the years. You'll never amount to nothing. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not athletic enough. You know that Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team and said that he was not good enough to play. But what if he would have believed the words that he wasn't good enough to play basketball? He won... I don't remember how many championships, but I'm sure at some point in all of our lives, someone said something to one of us, said something to each of us that could have changed the trajectory of our life. Or even worse, what have you told yourself? For years and years and years, I said, I'm not a public speaker. I don't like speaking in front of people. And for years, I believed it. And part of me now still wants to believe it because my flesh doesn't like it. But when we can get past our flesh and walk in whatever the Lord's got for us, whether it's public speaking, whether it's running a company, or whether it's taking out the trash, we should do everything as if we're doing it unto the Lord and not unto man. Because when we can do that, then we can be content exactly where we're at at that moment. In Ephesians 4, in the message translation, so if you try to follow along, this is not going to read the same. Ephesians 4 in the message says, Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word is a gift. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Do not take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. 
Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps, because each word is a gift. We've heard jokes. I think my mom and them, they joke about that we only get so many words while we're here on earth. And my stepdad tells my mom that she's used most of hers up already. <laughs> so she needs to be careful. But words are a gift. What gift are you giving to those that are around you? What type of gift are you presenting to your kids? Are we too harsh? Are we affirming? One thing I talk to my kids all the time about is talking about treating and talking to people the way they want to be talked to. Because one of them can talk harshly to another, and then 30 minutes later, the one who got her feelings hurt the first time is now talking harshly to the same one that talked harshly to them. So we're constantly working on, hey, no matter what they do, speak kindness and love into them. And eventually, their way of talking will change. But you know what's really sad that the, the Lord convicted me of a while back? And I've been working on this since about November. I'm not perfect at it. Some of my family may not even agree that I've been working on it. But my kids talk to each other like that because that's the way I talk to them. Or the way they see me talk to their, their mom. Those behaviors are learned behaviors. If you're talking harshly or short-tempered with someone in your household and your kids are watching and they will pick up on it and then they start doing it. But if we change the way we talk and that's one thing that we've been working on for a while now and every now and again Brandy has to remind me because I like to joke and kid with my kids. But sometimes I take it too far. And so I have to learn to rein that back in and learn to change that from joking manner to the reaffirming manner to be able to lift them up, to make them what Christ has them to be. Because one of my worst fears now is to look back in 10, 15, 20 years from now and know that my words held my kids back from something. or held my wife back from something that the Lord was calling her to do. In Ephesians 5, in the message version, it says, watch what God does and you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Don't allow love to turn into lust, setting off a downhill slide into sexual promiscuity, filthy practices, or bullying greed. Though some tongues just love the taste of gossip, those who follow Jesus have better uses for language than that. Don't talk dirty or silly. That kind of talk does not fit our style. Thanksgiving is our dialect. And everything come to him in thanksgiving. Praise his name. Love like he loves. If we do the things he does, then our talk will reflect that. You know that when you walk around with scriptures on your shirt or even something as a cross around your neck, or how about a King's Trail sticker on the back of your vehicle? And then you get into a traffic jam and you get road rage and you start cussing out the person beside you. I'm guessing some of you have done that before by the laughter that took place. But always remember that when you represent Christ, you may be the only Bible that that person ever reads. When you represent King's Trail with a sticker or a t-shirt or a ball cap, and then you act like that, 
you reflect upon this church. There was a time several years ago that I actually, there was uh, someone had a pickup truck, they had a sticker in their back window, and right beside this particular sticker was the King's Trail sticker. Well, the two stickers did not match <laughs> philosophies. And so I, I, I found out whose truck it was, and I went to him and I asked him, I said, I don't care if you want to keep the vulgar sticker, then keep the vulgar sticker. That's completely up to you. But I will ask, if you want to keep the vulgar sticker, please remove the King's Trail sticker. Right or wrong, indifferent. Some people got mad that I had the conversation with him. But he understood that by having that sticker in the back of his truck, he represented and was telling people, without his words, but he was telling people that he, what he believed in. The problem was the sticker that was next to it went against a lot of stuff that we believe in. And once he understood that, he went out and he scraped the, the profane sticker off of his truck. And so sometimes we just don't understand what we're doing or how we're doing it, and it can cause issues and problems. We're we doing on time. All right, let's fast forward. Mark eleven twenty three through twenty five in the Message translation. Apparently, I need to get a Message Bible. I do not own one. But apparently, I need to get one because half of these scriptures come from that translation. It says, Jesus was matter of fact. Embrace this God life. Really embrace it. And nothing will be too much for you. This mountain, for instance, just say go, jump in the lake. No shuffling or hem hawing and it is good as done. That is why I urge you to pray for absolutely everything, ranging from small to large. Include everything as you embrace this God life, and you'll get God's everything. And when you assume the posture of prayer, remember that if not, it's not all asking. If you have anything against someone, forgive. Only then will your heavenly Father be inclined to also wipe, wipe your slate clean of sins. So words have power. Words have the power to move mountains. It says, if you say to go jump in the lake, it will listen. But the problem with this is when we try to exercise that kind of power that our words have, we typically are holding something back in our hearts against another brother or sister in Christ. And so what to say at the end? If you have anything against someone, forgive. Only then your heavenly Father will be inclined to also wipe away your slate. We can use them to build up. We can use the words to tear down. Don't ever underestimate the power of your words because the devil doesn't. He will try to take what you've said and twist it and tweak it to bring death and destruction to those that are around you. Begin to take control of your life by taking control of your tongue. The problem with that lies in James. So flip back over to the book of James. In verse, chapter 3. Verse 1, the untamable tongue says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are large and so are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it, de that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. 
Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brother, things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. So many times we'll come here and we'll praise the Lord, sing his praise and worship during songs, and we'll take the message, and then when we leave out of here, we get into the trucks or cars to go to lunch, and we start to complain. Or we get an argument with our spouse or our kids, and we're screaming and hollering at them with hatred and anger and frustration. They don't go together. We got to be careful. We got to learn to speak as if things already were. Scripture tells us to speak as if they already were. The things that you desire, speak them into existence. That doesn't mean, hey, Lord Jesus, when I get home, please let there be a King Ranch in my driveway. <laughs> but if anybody has wants my address, I'll get it to you. But we have to speak the things as if we want them. The things that we desire in our lives, the love of Christ, the generosity in our hearts, those things that we desire to be more Christ-like, then we need to speak those things and start acting on them as if they already were. And it's hard. But there's a scripture after scripture, <coughs> excuse me, that talks about our words and, and how they respond in the world. Proverbs 2 or 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like sores, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You struggling with something physically? Pray about it. Pray for healing. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The mouth of the godly person gives wide as advice, but the tongue that deceives will be cut off. Wise words bring many benefits. Proverbs 12, 14. There's just so many in the Proverbs. And Do you see a man who has hasty words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Mark eleven twenty three. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. It's the New King James Version. That's the version you're probably used to. Matthew 15, 10 through 20. We'll start to wrap up. Ben, if you want to start coming up. It says, he then called the crowd together and said, listen and take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, but what you vomit up. Later, his disciples came and told him, did, did you know how upset the Pharisees were when they heard what you said? Jesus shrugged it off. Every tree that wasn't planted by my Father in heaven will be pulled up by its roots. Forget them. They are blind men leading blind men. When a blind man leads a blind man, they both end up in the ditch. Peter said, I don't get it. Put it in plain language. Jesus replied, you too? Are you being willfully stupid? Don't you know that anything that is swallowed works its way through the intestines and is finally defecated? But what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. From the heart that we vomit up evil arguments, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies, and cussing. What pollutes? That's what pollutes. Eating or not eating certain foods, washing or not washing your hands, that's neither here nor there. Kneeling on his knees in the garden, Jesus asked his father to remove his cup from him. He was about to go to his death. Be crucified on the cross for you and I, and he asked the Lord to remove this cup from him. But then he followed it up and said, not my will, but your will be done. I reckon there are probably some of you in here right now that the Lord has asked you to do something or laid something out in front of you that he wants you to go do, yet you're not being obedient. You're not being like Christ at this moment and saying, not my will, but your will. Maybe it's going to cost you something financially. 
Maybe it's a conversation that needs to play, take place, but you're worried that it will cost you a friendship or a family member. But we need to walk and talk like we are the heirs of the Most High King. There was a song I ran across. It's called the day, A Day with the Devil by Matt Mason. It starts out, it says, I left here this morning, my feet hard on the ground. Swore I wasn't coming back. We'd fought our final round. Then a stranger offered me a ride, so I took him up and climbed on inside. He said that I've got some things to do. I hope you don't mind. I figured what's the difference. I had lots of time. When I see his eyes, I sank in disbelief. I was riding with the devil, and I watched him do his deed. He told that lonely man to keep drinking, a simple child to just quit thinking, and begged the wife to cheat. He cursed the farmer's land and told that sick old soul to just give up, a teenage boy to take that puff, and whispered to me to let go of her hand. He said, I can't keep you here. No, not against your will. But go ahead and leave that girl and see how it feels. Boy, you know this world is a big old place and love not really real anyway. Don't last forever. You ought to roll the dice. You know I'd never tell a lie. Just take my advice. But I'd seen enough and told him we were through. I said to go to hell. There's some things I need to do. I told that lonely man to quit drinking. The simple child to just keep thinking. And I begged the wife to pray, and God bless the farmer's land. Told that sick old soul to not give in, the teenage boy to run for sin. And I came back home to take you by the hand. I know I could be a better man. We can all do better. We can all do better with our words and our thoughts. Because the thoughts, that they start in our heart and our mind, they come out our mouth. We need to think before we speak. Is the things that we're about to say, are they uplifting, kind, and loving? Do they point people from, to Christ or away from Christ? We need to bridle our emotions because we can't bridle our tongue. But we can bridle our emotions and walk and think and live more like Christ each day that allows our tongue to follow suit. Don't listen to the lie of the devil. Because he's right there beside you trying to whisper into your ear also. The difference is the Holy Spirit is inside you. And the knucklehead is on the outside looking in, trying to get you to ignore what you know inside to be right or wrong. Don't listen to what he has to say. He only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God, our Heavenly Father, wants what's best for us. He wants to provide the good gifts. When we just can swallow our pride and follow his promptings. Amen? Amen. Will you stand for me? Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for teaching us how to better control our emotions so you can better control our words. Lord, we give our mouths and our tongues over to you. Lord, we ask that you change the deceit of our heart, Lord, and replace it with the kindness, loving, forgiveness, Lord, that you've given us. Lord, the scripture says that may we all not become teachers because we'll face a stricter judgment. But Lord, if our calling is to become such a thing, Lord, we know that our judgment will be just because if we're walking in you, that forgiveness reigns. So Lord, we just ask that you watch over each one of us, be with each one of us, be with those that are hurting, those that are struggling. And Lord, if anybody here is still in this room that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, 
Lord, now is the time. We're never promised tomorrow. If they want to start a new life in you, Lord, draw them closer. Draw them in. Convince them that you're there to help. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer or want to talk, come down front. Pastors, elders, everybody, prayer warriors, come on down. Y'all have a blessed day. And if you were baptized, you're one of the ones that were baptized already this morning. Will you come up here and see Sandy? She's got a gift for you. <laughs>